Hello, everybody, and welcome to Real Crusades History. This is episode number eight of our First Crusade podcast series. We have finally reached the end of the long and epic First Crusade. So last time, we talked about the fall of Jerusalem in 1099 to the army of the First Crusade. Today, we're going to talk about the final military engagement of, her, of the First Crusade, which was the Battle of Ascalon in 1099, pretty much uh, shortly after the conquest of Jerusalem. And we're also going to talk about the establishment of the Kingdom of Jerusalem under Godfrey of Bouillon, and that kind of happened really right as Jerusalem fell and then kind of got uh, wrapped up after the Battle of Ascalon. So um, let's, let's get into this. Uh, my name is Jay Stephen Roberts. I'm going to be joined by Mr. Scott Amos. Scott? Hello, Stephen. Glad to be here with all you scholarly gentlemen again. Excellent, and we're very glad to have you with us. And we're also going to be joined by Mr. Rand Brown. Rand, how are you, sir? Deus Volt. Deus Volt. And um, <laughs> Rand is fresh off the uh, the gun range, as I understand it. So, uh, yeah. or was it, was it the gun range or the crossbow range, Rand? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we're in the 21st century, so it's the, uh, it's the, it's, it's the Marine Corps rifle range, so. Ah, okay. No covert crossbow operations? No, uh, that's, that's highly frowned upon. Movie stuff. Huh. I think, I, would, I guess if the Marine Corps rifle had existed back in 1099, that would have been Godfrey's favorite weapon, not the crossbow. Right? <laughs> so. It won. <laughs> it's not a, very, not a very artistic weapon. I'll 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 say that much. Yeah, the church probably would have banned it, but that probably wouldn't have. It wouldn't probably have would have had about the same effect as uh, the ban on the crossbow did. So, um, okay. So we're also going to be joined by um, our very distinguished academic guest, Dr. William Hamblin. Dr. Hamblin is a military historian who, uh, in his career, has focused on the Crusades, and Dr. Hamblin. Um, uh, taught for most of his career at BYU, correct, Dr. Hamblin? Right. Excellent. So welcome, Dr. Hamblin. Thanks for being with us again. Thanks for having me. All right, excellent. So here we are. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the final act of the First Crusade. So I'm just going to uh, get my primary source on here. I'm just going to read this little segment from Full Care of Chartres, my uh, all-time favorite author, or one of them at least. Um, this is just going to kind of launch us into this. So this is from Full Care. This is right after the, uh, the conquest of Jerusalem. He writes, O day so ardently desired, O time of times the most memorable, O deed before all other deeds, desired indeed because in the inner longing of the heart it had always been hoped by all believers in the Catholic faith that the place in which the creator of all creatures, God made man in his manifold pity for mankind, had by his birth, death, and resurrection conferred the gift of redemption, would be restored to its pristine dignity by those believing and trusting in him. They desired that this place, so long contaminated by the superstition of the pagan inhabitants, should be cleansed from their Contagion. So uh, I, I love stuff like that from the primary sources. It's, it's very, um, it's got sort of a biblical flavor to it. It's very epic. And it's kind of this, uh, this de declaration of perhaps the mood of the time among the Franks uh, through the eyes of a uh, French priest uh, that, that, who was um, a chaplain to Baldwin of Bologna and before that uh, came with Stephen of, uh, Stephen of Blois. Um, but yeah, this, this was a, a big moment. Uh, they had conquered Jerusalem. Uh, this was the, the, the spiritual goal of the crusade. This was what was kind of animating the, the common man who fought, um, in the army as well as, you know, it was a huge thing for the, the upper nobility as well. You know, we have guys like, uh, Raymond of Toulouse who kind of, this was how he was going to end his life, um, as sort of a pilgrim. Um, you know, uh, important noblemen like uh, Robert Curthose and Robert of Flanders, who, you know, they just came specifically to just to do this. And then uh, we're just going to pick up and, and head home. So, so yeah, this was a, a powerful moment um, in, 
uh, you know, in the crusade. And so what happens is once Jerusalem is, uh, is uh, under the control of the crusaders, um, first of all, there's kind of a mass, um, you, you know, there's, there's uh, the dividing up of the booty, for one thing. And one of the things Full Care says is that uh, people occupied buildings kind of at random. You know, the, the city, they'd, they killed most of the inhabitants, uh, the Muslim and Jewish inhabitants. And so, you, you know, if you were a poor person, you might uh, be able to kind of take control of a, a really nice house or something like that. Or, um, you know, the crusaders kind of spread throughout the city and occupied various portions of it. And the next thing that's going to come up is this issue of who is going to rule over Jerusalem. Because I think from the very beginning of the, you know, this idea of conquering Jerusalem, there had always been kind of this idea that Jerusalem was going to be an important, you know, uh, center of, of some new, um, was it going to be a kingdom? Was it going to be uh, some other type of state? Uh, a lot of that was still kind of unclear. And, okay, so we've got this idea, first of all, some of the sor the sources kind of differ on what they say happened uh, in terms of the establishment of the government. Um, there's some of them that say that uh, Raymond the Fourth of Toulouse was offered uh, rule of Jerusalem first of all, and he refused. And then after that, Godfrey of Bouillon was offered rule and he accepted it, but he didn't want to be called a king or a prince necessarily. He wanted to just because. Uh, for reasons of piety, but there may be some other reasons for that, which I think we're going to get into. But God, anyway, anyway, Godfrey Bouillon is going to be the one who's going to end up as the ruler of Jerusalem, uh, and he's going to take on this title of defender of the Holy Sepulchre. So, Dr. Hamlin, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to you here. Um, so, what do you think is going on here? Um, what are some of the issues that are faced with the establishment of rule in Jerusalem, and how, how do you view what happened uh, in the immediate aftermath of the fall of Jerusalem? Well, there were a whole bunch of unresolved uh, issues that needed to be dealt with, and some of the issues the Crusaders probably didn't even fully understand at, at the time. Conquering the city in some way was the easy part. And what followed is, is going to be the difficult part, that is establishing a viable kingdom. Uh, one of the issues is the relationship of religious to secular authority. Um, and, and basically, it, it, it seems likely that the idea of the Pope was to create Jerusalem as a papal state with Adamar as its ruler, but he dies of the plague in Antioch, and so um, that's not going to happen. So the question is, is the city to be ruled by the patriarch, or is the city to be ruled by a secular ruler? And everyone agreed the city needed both. It needed the patriarch, who is the religious leader, and it needed a king, or at least a, a lord to to defend the city. But what's the relationship of their authority is the question. And, and basically, that question's never fully resolved. You'll see lots of uh, kind of power struggles between uh, religious leaders and secular leaders throughout the history of the Crusade. And a, a lot of it is a matter of personal of personality. That is, a, a strong king could uh, rule more effectively than a weak king, and a strong patriarch likewise might be able to dominate a young or a weak a ruler. But at the moment uh, in 1099, uh, they first of all have to get a patriarch and they have to get a king. And basically both of these are done by election. And th they have a special problem in, in regard to the, the patriarchate. In ancient Christianity, there were five patriarchates, um, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, and Rome. And each of those, from the Eastern perspective, each of those is independent. Uh, from, from the Western perspective, the popes increasingly claimed um, some type of authority over all Christians, and therefore the pope is, is claiming uh, some type of authority 
at least nominal over, for example, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now, in the course of history, uh, three of those patriarchates, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch, had been conquered by Muslims. Uh, the patriarchates survive, but essentially lack political authority. So the only ones with real political authority are the patriarch Constantinople and the patriarch or the, of Rome, or who is the pope. So the question now becomes, are we going to have a patriarch in Jerusalem who is independent, uh, like the other patriarchs were, and, and should he be an Easterner, that is to say a Greek or an Armenian or Syriac or something, or should he be a Latin uh, Christian? And, and should the patriarch, it, it, from the Latin perspective, the patriarch of Jerusalem should be subordinate to the Pope. And in, in practice, the Pope should pick him, but in reality, the Pope could confirm him uh, because of the distance that they had to travel. So they had a big problem with that. And then they have the problem of who to pick to be the patriarch. And this is a power politic issue because uh, the patriarch who would control uh, all sorts of land and wealth could also uh, give patronage to political leaders. So if you were a political lord, you'd want a patriarch of Jerusalem who would be uh, your ally and not your enemy or your foe or an ally of one of your political rivals. So there were lots of different issues going on in this, but basically uh, it, it, it comes down to a, an election uh, the, the current Greek patriarch was named Simeon, but he had died recently, and so the city, was, the, the patriarchate was vacant, and so they elected a man named Arnulf uh, to be the patriarch, and it's, it's not quite clear to me why they picked him. Uh, he doesn't seem to have been a very pleasant or spiritual fellow, but... Uh, uh, he was he a, no, no, a Norman, a Norman right? Right? Yeah, so, so it's, it's, I mean, it's probable it's, it's political issue behind the scenes type of stuff. But at any rate, uh, the patriarchate is, is chosen in that way, but uh, very shortly thereafter, a fleet arrives from Pisa with a man named Dagobert, who is, or Dimebert, it's depending on uh, which dialect you're speaking. But at any rate, he, um, he claim, he's an archbishop. He claims to have some type of authorization from the Pope, and he replaces Arnulf, and, and in practical terms, then he becomes the, the first patriarch in 11, uh, 1100 of um, Jerusalem. And basically, from the perspective of the Eastern Christians, the Latin Christians are usurping their churches and their offices. That is to say, they see the Latins as foreigners, they want a Greek or an Armenian in control of, say, a church where the Armenians had always worshipped. Uh, now a Latin person gets put in charge of that. And so it creates a lot of tension also between Eastern Christians and uh, Latin Christians. By Eastern, I mean uh, Greek, Armenian, uh, Syriac, Coptic, um, Georgians, groups like that. So... Uh, the Patriarchate is established, however, and remains then a, a crucial part of the kingdom for good sometimes and for ill sometimes uh, throughout the next uh, hundred years or so till the city falls. Right. And it's kind of interesting um, because, okay, the traditional idea is that Godfrey of Bouillon only takes the, the uh, title of Advocate of the Holy Sepulchre out of piety, like this idea that he did not want to call himself a king in a city where Christ wore a crown of thorns. And that uh, certainly could be the case, but it may also have been that there was some tension between the clerical establishment that they did not want there to be a secular leader in Jerusalem who was going to have a title like king or prince. Uh, if when we're talking about Danebert of Pisa, he seems to have been particularly keen on having a clerical dominated government in Jerusalem. And we kind of see that issue come up again and again throughout Godfrey's reign for this, this year, you know, between Godfrey's election in the summer of 1099 and his death in the summer of 1100, there's 
this issue that Dame Bert kind of tries to exercise control over Godfrey and kind of almost treats Godfrey like, you know, a sort of a second, you know, sort of a junior partner in a way. And the idea is that Jerusalem is going to be ruled by, by Dame Bert. And Dame Bert is kind of able to do that because uh, of his, uh, his financial resources. And the situation really isn't going to be resolved until Baldwin the first of Jerusalem is elected, at which point he is going to kind of once and for all put the patriarchate under the, you know, um, uh, sway of the, the crown. And he's going to kind of establish this precedent that's going to endure. And that is of a powerful monarch at the, at, at the head of the kingdom of Jerusalem. He doesn't hesitate to adopt the title of king and the patriarch kind of becomes a creature of the crown at that point. And from then on, we really do have a lot of patriarchs who really sort of act um, in accordance with the policy of the monarch. But anyway. But it's interesting to note in that regard that the, the papal model uh, as understood at this time was that the Pope was a completely independent ruler. There was no king that, that shared power or ruled over the Pope. And then in theory, the imperial papacy theory said, well, the Pope is in fact the Lord over, uh, you know, the Holy Roman Emperor, the King of France. These are all uh, subsidiary to him in some degree. That, that's the Western conception. In, in the Byzantine conception, the, the, the king, there is a king and a pope in the same city, Constantinople, the, the emperor and the pope. And they, uh, essentially, the, the, the patriarch has to crown the emperor, and the emperor has to agree to the patriarch. So they're, they're interdependent with one another. And um, the, so the question for Jerusalem is, should it be a papal state? with a religious leader who is also the secular authority, or should it be a Byzantine-style state with a king and patriarch as allies or rivals, but, but both together uh, sharing the rule of the city? And so the initial plan of uh, Dimebert was probably more along the papal lines. The pope doesn't have any secular uh, superior or equal, neither should the patriarch of Jerusalem, who is one of the five great patriarchs. But in practical terms, that was probably unworkable uh, because of the crucial military needs of the, of the state. Uh, you had to have a king who, who could really do what he needed to do uh, to both expand the state and protect the state. Right, uh, because of the constant state of war, basically, with the, the Muslim powers around them, you need a king who is going to be able to pretty much use the resources of the church at will. And that's, that's, kind of, that's the model that pretty much existed from, from the time of Baldwin, the first rule on, but that really wasn't fully established in Godfrey's time. Godfrey kind of had to put up with a lot of, uh, um, you know, I guess we could say meddling or perhaps, um, you know, inability to fully control, to, to exercise rule, um, you know, Dame Bert kind of uh, getting in the way of that. Um, I do think in terms of, if we're talking about the Byzantine model, um, I think that, you know, the, the patriarch of Constantinople is kind of a creature of the empire, like in, in a lot of ways. I, I, do, you, do you guys agree with that? Like Rand, do you agree with that? Or uh, I'm here. I, go, repeat the question. Well, okay. I, I kind of think the model that ended up being established in Jerusalem is si it's kind of similar to to what we see in um, Constantinople, and that is that the patriarch is kind of kind of almost an arm of the of the emperor. I mean, d do you think that's true, Doctor Hamblin? You know, it was it was a little bit more. I, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that because it, it, it there wasn't ever kind of a clear superiority inferiority that you see throughout the, the the history of the kingdom of Jerusalem at least at least with the the with you know with the Latin kingdoms um, it, it's not like the you don't have the um, you don't have the very clear distinction between 
the patriarchs in Constantinople and, and, and the Byzantine emperors, because they're, they're coming from a very different cultural background. Um, the, you know, the Byzantine emperors are uh, still following the sort of the old uh, Roman tradition that, that ultimately went all the way back to, you know, back when emperors still considered themselves Pontifex Maximus uh, and, and things like that. So um, I, I would say in the, in the Latin kingdoms, you, you had a little bit of a different, they were more sort of, they're almost more sort of partners, um, you know, with neither one being superior to the other. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, I feel like when, when it came to, uh, when it came to decisions of defense, when it came to, you know, decisions of the state, um, the patriarchs, you know, there was sort of an understanding that, um, you know, they, they took a back seat to that. Um, and allowed the you know allowed the king and the and the nobles to 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 make those decisions um, most of the time not not all the time but most of the time uh, which is what you see predominantly through Western Europe during the medieval period as a whole um, you know the the idea that separation of church and state was a modern invention is uh, is is kind of a um, is, is kind of a, a misconception um, and and uh, it just wasn't as um, it just wasn't as dramatic as you know as it became in the post enlightenment era. But um, yeah, I, I would say that it, it was a, it was a very nuanced relationship, and um, a lot of it depended on the personalities. But but yeah, Godfrey made it very clear from the very beginning that um, that that relationship was going to be a thing. That you know the patriarchs were not going to to just rule roughshod. Um, what do you mean Baldwin, you know, right? Or, or yeah, Baldwin. It, well, and, and, and I think Godfrey, Godfrey kind of helped establish some of that uh, in, in his very brief tenure as, as, as defender of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'll let, uh, I'll let Dr. Hamlin. Uh, uh, I think the, the, um, the patriarchs were basically chosen by the emperor, and sometimes they were deposed by an emperor. But the patriarchs could also uh, were supposed to crown the emperor, and so uh, and they could theoretically uh, punish the emperor. And they had times like the iconoclast controversy back in the eighth and ninth centuries, where the patriarchs and emperors were at odds with each other and and, and things like that. But but the at, at its most basic level. The, the Pope claimed the donation of Constantine gave him uh, independent authority over Rome and, and central Italy. And the Patriarch of Jerusalem, or Patriarch of Constantinople would never make that claim. He, he did not have independent authority. It was intimately related to the state. And after the fall of uh, Constantinople, it becomes kind of problematic for the Patriarch. And... Uh, you get the Patriarch of Russia uh, kind of taking over in, in some of the claims of the Byzantine uh, Patriarch. But the point is the Pope had no secular ruler with which to share power in Rome. There was no Duke of Rome. There was no King of Rome. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor kind of made that claim, but uh, he, he didn't have any real power in Rome. Whereas in Jerusalem, there is no independent Patriarchy. It is interdependent and even dependent on the kingship. So it's it's more of a Byzantine style uh, situation than than one like the Roman Pope. And in fact, probably it couldn't be like the Roman Pope because the Pope claimed uh, supremacy over the Patriarch of Jerusalem. Yeah, and I, I don't, you know, I think that. Um, um, once uh, that that precedent was established by Baldwin the first, I mean, it the the relationship seemed to function pretty smoothly throughout. I'm, you know, the 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 real time we see any kind of tension between the the ruler of Jerusalem and the patriarch is, the, at you know, this point with Godfrey and Dambert. But um, you know, once Baldwin had kind of firmly subordinated the church, uh, that was. That was it. I mean, you know, we look at like a like a king like Baldwin the Second of Jerusalem, for example. He had a patriarch Varmund, who, um, you know, 
controlled the kingdom while while uh, Baldwin II was in captivity, and uh, pretty much just uh, stuck to Baldwin II's policy. And you know, was a close personal friend of Baldwin's, and you know, that's kind of the the norm in um, um, in the history of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. So, but you know, I mean, we ha we do have some similar things in um, you know in other parts of Europe in the medieval world at this time, I don't think this is even that unprecedented. Like for example, um, in the kingdom of Castile, you've got the Archbishop of Toledo, who is um, kind of a, you know, kind of an R, I mean, I'm not gonna say he's an arm of the, of the monarch or anything like that, but um, traditionally kind of acted as sort of a uh, supporter of the monarchy, um, uh, su supporter of the king's policies, uh, you know, the guy who'd be who'd be there riding riding in with him into into battle and that kind of thing, um, you know, one of his um, closest advisors and that sort of thing. So, well, you've got the Archbishop of Canterbury in England as well, that type of right. thing. Right, but mm -hmm. but patriarch is theoretically a different uh, office than archbishop. Archbishop Arch, uh, Archbishop is clearly subordinate to uh, the Pope. And the Patriarch of Jerusalem, in its traditional form, of uh, uh, you know Greek Patriarch of Jerusalem, would would not claim uh, to be subordinate to the Pope. And, and I don't I don't think the Latins ever understood it that way, though. I mean, I think no, no, yeah, uh, I'm sure they didn't. Yeah, for for the Latins, I mean, it was very clear that the Patriarch was you know he, he kind of had a role like an Archbishop. You know, he was he was definitely uh, subordinate to the Pope. Um, um, but anyway, so I guess we've kind of <laughs> we, we've kind of uh, gone over that pretty pretty thoroughly. But uh, so yeah, so that's the situation we're in. Godfrey becomes uh, defender of the Holy Sepulcher, and pretty quickly after that, we have this issue come up that uh, the Fatimids down in Egypt are going to try to reverse the situation. Uh, the um, ruler of Fatimid Egypt, Al Afdal assembles a substantial army and um, is going to make an attack on, on Jerusalem. And so the Crusaders decide that they're going to try to deal with the situation, um, you know, with the old, the best defense is a good offense uh, concept. So Godfrey rallies uh, Robert of Flanders and Tancred, uh, and they set out pretty quickly to to counter this situation. And then uh, Raymond of Toulouse and Robert of Normandy are going to join them shortly after that to um, combine their forces and challenge this Fatimid uh, offensive. So, okay, Dr. Hamblin, what do you think? Uh, what happens here? Well, I'll have to, um the first thing to note that is that he is the son of a man named Badr Jamali, who was an Armenian Mamluk. And so Al Afdal actually uh, grew up in a family where Armenian was the uh, the mother tongue of his uh, his clan. And there were a lot of Christian Armenians that were serving in Egypt. They built uh, a dozen or so churches and had maybe uh, ten or fifteen thousand Armenian mercenaries who served the Fatimids, specifically this dynasty. They, they got other Armenians. So al uh relationship with the Crusaders is not necessarily antagonistic uh, at its base, but it was in the sense that uh, the Fatimids had once ruled about uh, 30, 40 years earlier, had ruled all of Syria and all of uh, Lebanon and all of modern Palestine, Israel, and, and Jordan. They basically controlled that. Now, they'd lost it in the 1070s to the Turks, who had, who had conquered most of those cities. That's why the Crusaders faced Turks at Antioch instead of uh, Fatimids. The Fatimids had faced, uh, at, at the coming of the Crusaders, they'd just gotten out of one... Uh, long, uh, terrible civil war, and we're kind of getting into another one with a, a man named Nizar. Uh, well, we won't get into the succession crisis of the Fatimids, but there was a succession crisis 
So Al Afdal was was having all sorts of difficulties uh, politically and militarily in his own hometown. He wanted to. He took Jerusalem in 1098, so he'd only ruled it for a few months before the Crusaders came on the scene, and he wanted to get it back. And he wanted also to extend his power up the coast. He had several cities along the coast, like Ascalon, but he wanted to to expand that power. So. So strategically, his goal was um, he'd be willing to make a deal with the Crusaders. There was no ideological, uh, you know, jihad-type ideology against the Crusaders. It was pure uh, power politics. You, I have Jerusalem. You took it from me. I want to get it back. Uh, that type of thing. And he um, he had a problem in that he's a several days journey through the. Uh, Sinai Peninsula to get to Ascalon uh, for, with his army. He had a, a fleet, but they couldn't carry his entire army there. So he, he crossed the desert and then gets to Ascalon, and basically the army has to rest and recuperate because it, it's a tough uh, march through the desert there. And uh, he expected Jerusalem to be able to hold out. I mean, his experience of uh, Crusader siege craft is that they're no good at it. They, they couldn't take Antioch by storm. They couldn't take um, Arca by storm. Uh, and, and so why should they be able to take Jerusalem? So he was expecting the siege to go on and he slowly gathered his army and was coming in. Basically his plan was to relieve Jerusalem. That is to march up to Jerusalem and uh, drive off the crusaders before they'd taken the city. So mistake number one was to underestimate the crusaders and their capacity to take Jerusalem. When they get Jerusalem, he arrives a few weeks later with his army at Ascalon, and he has probably about 20,000 men. Uh, you're, it's possible, not at this battle, but it's possible by analyzing uh, various Egyptian records to determine about the size of an Egyptian field army on average, and so about that many men, the Crusaders had about 13,000. And so he was expecting um, to, to go on the offensive, and he was basically making preparations, getting more supplies by sea, etc. at Ascalon. He, had, he just didn't know the Crusaders. This is a, a big advantage of the Crusaders, is they faced the Rum Seljuks and they, the Rum Seljuks have to learn how to fight the Crusaders. Then he faces the Syrian Turks, and they have to learn all over again. And then he faces the Egyptians, and, and they just don't know how the Crusaders operate. Uh, that is to say, he had no expectation of an offensive from an army that he had outnumbered three to two. So when the Fatimids are, are camped there, the Crusaders... Uh, make the determination, uh, probably correct, that if if they don't attack the, the Fatimids in the field, they're going to have to endure a siege at Jerusalem. And if they are besieged in Jerusalem, they're going to face all sorts of, of problems there with supplies because they're not near the coast. They don't have, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a, a, a difficult situation. So, so they're Essentially, their strategic situation is we've got to get rid of these guys fast. One other thing we should note is on August 5th, the Crusaders discovered the True Cross. Now, this uh, the True Cross was originally discovered by Helena, the mother of Constantine, way back in the early 4th century. Uh, and it's, that's an interesting story of how they found that. But... Uh, it, you know, it was a big piece of wood that they found there, and uh, they'd started shaving off little bits and pieces and giving them to pilgrims or giving them to kings. And so there were little fragments of the True Cross all over the place. And this one was not a huge, it wasn't like three or four feet long, but it was a, a you know, fairly substantial piece of the cross that the, the Christian, the Eastern Christians, claimed that they had hidden when the Turks took the city so that the Turks wouldn't steal it because they had encrusted it with gold gems and made kind of a reliquary for it. And, and so they found the true cross and it, its role in the psychology and the spirituality of the crusaders 
was probably rather similar to the discovery of the um, Holy Lance at Antioch. That is, the Crusaders uh, spiritually had been galvanized first by their great victory at Jerusalem. That, that is, this is the greatest manifestation of God's uh, power and approval of the crusade. And then shortly thereafter, the discovery of the true cross, which they then carry in battle down to Ascalon, again, uh, was a, a great spiritual sign to the crusaders that God was on their side. So they had uh, surprise, they had uh, higher morale than the Egyptians, and they mobilized at Ramla, which is about 50 miles from Ascalon, and then they took off and decided we're going to do a surprise attack. And as they marched down uh, towards Ascalon, would have taken them probably two days to get there, uh, Al-Afdal apparently didn't send out scouts and didn't, he was just not expecting the Crusaders uh, to attack. He was expecting them to be on the defensive. And so uh, this underestima underestimation of the Crusader will and ability uh, led to a, you know, a, a forthcoming disaster for our left uh, You want me to stop there or keep going? Well, that's I mean, background to the battle. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good background to the battle. Um, uh, so, so I think, you know, one thing about the, the Battle of, of Ascalon is it didn't last very long. Um, it was, you know, like you're saying, Dr. Hamblin, there was a lot of element of surprise there. Um, and pretty much what the Crusaders were able to do was, was end the thing pretty quickly with a couple of decisive charges. Uh, one difference in the Fatimid army from, say, like a Seljuk Turk army is going to be, there's not going to be a lot of horse archers and there's not going to be this kind of, um, you know, rush in and pepper the enemy with arrows and then like, you know, uh, scatter kind of the harassing tactics of the, of the mounted archers of the Seljuk Turks. Uh, this is going to be more of an army that maybe would be more similar to maybe a, a uh, sort of maybe the, the, the traditional Arab army um, from, from earlier periods, uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, infantry archers. You're going to have uh, mounted lancers, that sort of thing. Um, and so I know the thing that R.C. Smale kind of uh, famously said is that the Fatimid army provided a solid target for the charge of the Crusaders. Like, um, you know, they're able to actually just like uh, hit them with, with a uh, concerted cavalry charge and it, it's, you know, they're able to do damage to them that way. Um, so, so yeah, Dr. Hamlet, did you have any comments about the, the battle specifically? Like, um, you know, what actually happens? Right. Um, well, basically, the, the Fatimids were, were camped out on the outskirts of the city of Ascalon in the plains around the city. Al-Aftal himself was probably in the city. Uh, you know, he, they're camping there. He probably went in and stayed in the citadel or the palace or, or whatever. Uh, it was around dawn, and like I said, they hadn't scouted properly, and so were not aware of the approach of a crusader army. The, the crusaders had captured a bunch of uh, livestock that had been grazing in the area around Ascalon, and the, the livestock were being herded along with the army and kind of following the army, and it made it look much uh, larger than it was. It, essentially made them, you know, from a distance, it made them look like they had more cavalry. But the Fatimid army was uh, a traditional uh, Middle Eastern army of uh, pre-Seljuk times. Uh, about one-third cavalry, maybe one-half cavalry, and one-half infantry. But they had a, a definite infantry component, whereas, say, the Rome Seljuks in Anatolia probably had no infantry. Everyone was mounted, and the Crusaders mentioned that. Hmm. And and so the infantry, their their function was to form a shield wall with archers behind, uh, rather like a Byzantine army, and and broadly like uh, a Crusader army, and then have cavalry uh, uh, fight on the flanks, and then hopefully take one flank, and then you can hit the the army in the in the sides or the rear or something like that. The problem for the Fatimids was twofold. The Crusaders suddenly appear on the horizon and they, they sound the alarm, 
but the army is is still encamped and they're not prepared for combat and so everyone runs around trying to grab their armor grab their weapons figure out where their regiment is and, it, and it's anarchy in the camp they manage to get uh, the infantry together at least some of the infantry and form a battle line uh, but as far as we can tell from the sources the the cavalry don't participate at all in the battle the Fatimid cavalry probably their horses were out pasturing and it's it's so the uh the the Fatimid cavalry had to arm themselves go out and find their horse and then organize uh the cavalry into units so that they could go into battle and the battle was over before they could do that so as far as we can tell you know there were probably cavalry running around but no tactical units of cavalry uh the the infantry prepare themselves uh or some of them do but they get hit by this uh crusader cavalry charge which they'd never experienced before and were not fully organized uh to uh accept uh albert of Aachen talks about this one group called azoparts and why he calls them that's not clear but uh these were uh black Africans uh, from Sudan and maybe from East Africa who f were formed into big uh, heavy infantry uh, battalions and they, they were armed with two-handed maces that uh, apparently they, they'd whack the horses with these and they would just bring the horse down. They, they were uh, these huge heavy uh, maces and, and so they made somewhat of a stand but uh, the infantry pretty quickly uh, crumble under the crusader attack and the crusaders probably outflanking the infantry to some extent get into the camp itself and they capture the royal standard that is the the banner of al afdal and, and it's, it's robert kurthos who actually captures it right 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 that's right and then he i think he later sells it right I don't know, but <laughs> captures the standard and when that occurs when the royal standard goes down it, it kind of means like in chess the king is taken and uh, the, By this time there are crusaders in the camp behind whatever Fatima infantry are there and so they disintegrate uh, disintegrate very rapidly and then the whole Fatima army uh, panics and collapses and just scatters all over. Some of them uh, go into the sea to escape. Uh, some of them, lots of them try to get into the city of Ascalon, but it's, you know, when you have uh, 5,000 people trying to get in through a gate that's 20 or 30 feet wide, it's not gonna happen. And uh, some of them go and hide in orchards where they're uh, picked off by the Crusaders and, and so forth. So the Crusaders capture the camp and there's just a massive booty. There's lots of treasure and so forth. And uh, uh, Al Afdal managed to manages to escape by sea uh, because it's a big naval port of the Fatimids. The Fatimids have the only viable uh, Muslim navy in the Middle East at this time, and uh, the Crusaders end up in control or uh, with extraordinarily extraordinary wealth and in control of the battlefield. But they don't take Ascalon itself. And it's, it's kind of a, you know, with the battle, you see the great uh, dynamic strength of a crusader army. And with the aftermath and the failure to take Ascalon, you see their great weakness. And uh, now that's talk about that now or, or a little later? Well, I mean, that's an interesting issue because I think, um, you know, the whole idea of, was there an opportunity to take Ascalon or not? Um, it's kind of, kind of somewhat controversial. I've read some different opinions from different historians on it. I, but yeah, I don't know if we're if we're going to jump into that right now. Um, th does anybody else have any comments about the Battle of Ascalon? Uh, Scott or Rand, do either of you have anything you wanted to add or any questions you wanted to bring up? Well, uh, now I understand that. Uh, the Fatim has refused to negotiate with anyone than, uh, other than Raymond of Toulouse. Uh, at the city of Ascalon, after the battle, that's right, yes. And you know, Raymond had a, had a score. I mean, they trusted him. Am I right on that? He was the... Well, 
when when the I mean, when uh, Jerusalem was taken, maybe that's... Raymond gave his protection to uh, the citadel. The citadel was surrendered. Right. To him, that's what and I was he promised referring. to protect the everyone in the citadel. And the problem was everyone else in Jerusalem was massacred. So only those who surrendered to Raymond survived. And those guys go to Ascalon and say, you know, when it comes time to ask, should we surrender Ascalon or not? All the survivors from Jerusalem says, don't trust any crusader except Raymond. Now, Raymond gave them safe conduct and an right. escort from Jerusalem. Is that correct, Dr. Right. Hamlet? From the citadel of Jerusalem to uh, Ascalon. He, he okay, so yeah, well, it's my understanding that yeah. they refused, at, after Ascalon, they refused to negotiate with anyone but Raymond. Right. But there was a problem between Raymond. Yeah, yeah, it was a big mess, like yeah. you are saying. And 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 they ended up. Well, I think with Fatima still in control of Ascalon. I think there's some question about that, though. Um, okay, so a lot of our main source, like Full Care of Chartres and the Guest of Frank Corum, don't really say anything about what happened after the Battle of Ascalon, and this idea that this idea that there was this possibility of taking control of the city, it comes from, a, it comes from Albert of Aachen and it comes from Ralph of Kahn, both of whom were not, both of whom were, were not involved in the crusade itself. And Albert of Aachen wrote his chronicle from the perspective of Godfrey of Bouillon as his hero and sort of demonizes Raymond of Toulouse throughout the chronicle like that's kind of in fact kind of a lot of the, the the negative stereotypes about raymond kind of come from albert of Aachen. so i and then another issue is the one muslim source we have that actually talks about the battle of ascalon and the aftermath of it doesn't say anything about the muslims of ascalon actually being willing to surrender the city to anybody um that is ibn al Kalanisi. And what he says is that the, the Muslims of Ascalon offer to pay tribute to the Crusaders, uh, basically kind of like a protection payment, but that there were disagreements among the leadership of the Crusade, and so the negotiations for that fell through. That's pretty much all. They don't say anything about Raymond. Or, or even Al Kalanisi doesn't say anything specifically about Raymond of Toulouse. Well, my information is coming from secondary sources, so... Well, right. Yeah, and I think that that's... Um, you know, uh, I think it's, 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 it's uh, Albert of Aachen or uh, Ralph of Kahn who kind of talk about, uh, you know, this idea that, um, uh, that, that Raymond's greed or something or his refusal to, to give the city over to Godfrey kind of resulted in uh, the, um, the breakdown of... of uh, this ability to to take the city but you know well, the reality is probably all the stories are true that is to say the egyptians probably said we want to surrender or we want to negotiate with raymond and and uh godfrey said no it's got to be surrender to me and the egyptians were probably faking it halfway just you know in, in other words rather than let them assault the city let's let's talk and keep the talks going as long as possible so, you know, it's, and there were probably factions within Ascalon. Some of them would say, we'll never surrender. Some would say, maybe we'll surrender. So I'm sure it was just a mess and complicated and negotiations going on with different groups over different things. And uh, personally, I think uh, Ascalon would not have surrendered, even though they negotiated with Raymond, they were mm -hmm. buying time. And it wasn't a serious negotiation because it was a strong city and could be supported by sea from Egypt. So, yeah, I don't think there was any real danger of Ascalon actually being um, falling to the Crusaders at that time. I think the idea that, you know, something Raymond did or something like that spoiled the opportunity to take Ascalon is, is kind of is, is kind of silly. Yeah. And it takes Crusaders 50 years to to get the city because it's. 
It's both yes. its defensive strength and its nearness to Egypt and its access as a major port for Egyptian uh, support of the city if, if, during a siege. So we have, we have here a much more complex situation than just a squabble between Raymond and, and Godfrey. As, as most things in history usually are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I think we have to be careful about over, you know, to what extent, um, you know, I think there, there probably was tension between Godfrey and Raymond. We know that. But how serious was it? I mean, you know, at the Battle of Ascalon, they, they, they unite without an issue and, uh, and fight that battle together. Um, and again, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting that full care of Chartres and the guest of Frank Corum don't say anything about any of that, you know? Yeah. There's, there's nothing in those sources about what happens after this victory at Ascalon. Um, John and Loretta Hill in their biography of Raymond IV of Toulouse, they actually suggest that what the disagreement may have been among the crusaders was whether or not to besiege Ascalon at all. Mm. Because for guys like Robert of Flanders and Robert Curthose, you know, they've secured Jerusalem. They defeated this army that was threatening Jerusalem. They weren't interested in getting involved in another protracted siege, like a, a siege of Ascalon would, would have been an enormous undertaking. Whereas Godfrey may have been interested in doing that. So that may be, you know, when Ibn al Kalanisi says, um, you know, they, the, the citizens of, of Ascalon offer tributary payment, offer tributary payment to the Crusaders, but um, disagreements among the Crusaders led to, to them never collecting that tribute. That may be what they were talking about. They may, may have been talking about the fact that there was disagreement about whether or not to besiege Ascalon at all. So, and I think we have to be very careful about Albert of Aachen. You know, Albert of Aachen kind of writes, I mean, it's, he's a valuable source, but he kind of writes in a way that he is trying to lionize Godfrey of Bouillon. And part of the way he does that a lot of times is anytime there's something that maybe kind of would look embarrassing for Godfrey, he sort of blames it on Raymond. It says, well, Raymond of Toulouse was a big jerk, you know, and he wouldn't go, he wouldn't go along with what our hero Godfrey wanted to do. So you can't take that totally seriously. All of the sources are, are that way to some degree. I mean, you've got uh, Ralph and Tancred and uh, right. Bulker and, uh, you know, they kind of have patrons they're writing for. Uh, and, you know, in, in a sense, this is like, politicians squabbling in Washington and having their uh, their journalists, you know, saying pro or con things about uh, different politicians. It's, it's, there's an element of that to, um, to the sources as well. Yeah. Both for and against Raymond and for and against Godfrey and so forth. I uh, think full care is pretty neutral for the most part in the way yeah. he talks about the various, le various rulers. Yeah, some of them are more biased than others. Like Ralph is really over the top for Tancred. Right, Ralph is pretty pretty heavily Nor Norman biased, and he he also kind of demonizes Raymond. And the same thing with Albert. So, and I think the guest of Frank Corum to some extent maybe is a little bit uh, uh, demonizing of Raymond, although c quite a bit less than um, than uh, Ralph of Con. But anyway, so some interesting stuff here. Uh, guys. Um, all right, so what do we want to cover next? Does anybody have any further comments about sort of the aftermath of the Battle of Ascalon? Um, well, I think it's, uh, it secures the southern front for a, a, a while, but it doesn't eliminate the problem. That is, the Fatiman army was defeated, but the, strategically they could still send in troops, and they're going to continue operations in, you know, based at Ascalon, against uh, the Crusader Kingdom uh, for several years to come. So it, it's a major victory, but uh, not decisive in the sense that it eliminates uh, the southern front with Egypt. Right, exactly. And, you know, the Fatimids are going to be one of the major enemies of the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the reign of Baldwin I. Right. That's, that's something that I think we kind of forget sometimes is, is um, you know, the, the Fatimids were kind of in a state of decline, you might say, but they were still a very uh, potent power in the region, and they were they were they were one of the major powers um, that the Crusaders had to deal with, you know, unquestionably. So, 
So yeah, so that's that's really where we are at this point. The Battle of Ascalon does um, kind of wrap things up for the time being. Um, you know, it, it removes the immediate, like, you know, pretty much what Dr. Hamlin just said, you know, it removes the immediate threat to Jerusalem and it's going to kind of get things on the road. Um, the kingdom of Jerusalem is, is nothing like what it's going to be um, in a few years at this point. It's really barely a kingdom at all. It's kind of Jerusalem and Ramla and a few like little fortresses here and there and then Jaffa. And it's, it's, it's 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 pretty a, it's a remarkable situation at this point. I mean, really, it's just it's a few isolated outposts in the midst of this kind of sea of uh, of uh, Muslim enemies. Um, so so yeah, it's it's an interesting situation, and you know the the real work of building the kingdom is going to to, to really get going in the next uh, few years, and really in particular um, Baldwin. Of, of Bologna, who is going to become, you know, Baldwin the first of Jerusalem a year from now, is is really the guy who really uh, kind of builds the kingdom. Godfrey um, doesn't have as much of a chance to, I guess you might say. Um, you know, of course, I think some argue he he wasn't uh, anything of the uh, leader that his his brother Baldwin was. But um, anyway, so. Um, well, I think it's worth noting, too, that it, it takes, you know, we think the First Crusade conquered the Holy Land. It didn't. It, it takes another generation before the kingdom is really secure. Uh, right, yeah. Both from Baldwin and also from Antioch. And then uh, Raymond and the Provençals go form a state in Tripoli uh, a little bit later. Uh, and so... Um, that's why I said earlier the hard parts yet to come in, in some ways. Uh, well, the after the after Ascalon, I mean the main body of crusaders begin to leave for Europe. Correct. Yeah, that's an important fact to note. Is that uh, most of the crusaders go home after Ascalon. And yeah, you know, I mean, Godfrey is left with basically just a skeleton force. It, probably seventy to eighty percent go home, which, in, in part, is um, kind of demonstrates the spiritual nature of the whole enterprise because it wasn't an army to take Jerusalem; it was an army to go on pilgrimage and take Jerusalem. That is, the pilgrimage element was one of the the crucial thing in the minds of the crusaders. And once they had fulfilled that vow, they had done their duty and received the spiritual blessings and so forth. And most of them go home. That is, their goal is not to conquer land and gather wealth. It's, it's to uh, go on pilgrimage, free Jerusalem, and then uh, we're done. And so Godfrey is left uh, with maybe 300 knights and 2,000 infantry after um, after 1099, and he sends out a desperate call for more crusaders. I mean, he is in desperate military situation, and that leads to the crusade of 1101 um, a couple of years after the fall of Jerusalem. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's that's going to be the big issue um, in the Crusader states is lack of manpower. And, um, you know, when you look at the history of the Crusader states, it, it really is just this remarkable thing that they were able to establish anything there. But the truth is they established an incredibly, vi uh, you know, viable and uh, potent uh, set of states. Uh, they're kind of on, on the on the. Syrian and Palestinian coast. I mean, you know, how how viable they were long term uh, certainly is up for debate, but without question, uh, these are considerable states that end up being established here. So, well, and, and it was a, an extremely vibrant, um, uh, you know, a lot of people don't, especially these days with the, you know, the, the, the postmodern um, attitude towards the Crusades, a lot of people really don't appreciate the full. Uh, historic impact that that the Crusades had on just the development of world history. Um, it, it, you know, the, the Crusader kingdoms were, um, you know, they were not these, uh, you know, they were not these um, 
you know, they, they weren't they weren't they weren't a bunch of religious fanatics, you know, that 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 they're portrayed as today that were just out to kill and destroy and uh, and everything. They they built extremely vibrant societies uh, out there that that lasted for almost 200 years. And, and they, they really did make a, a, a significant mark on both the development of, of Western history and, and opening up the West to the East. Um, and, and, you know, which was something that really hadn't happened uh, since, since, you know, the, the, the Byzantine Empire lost uh, the Levant to, to the early Islamic conquest. So, you know, it, it was, it was kind of the, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, a, a reopening uh, of, of, or, or a reunification of East and West uh, in a lot of ways, and and uh, you saw that have an impact on on trade. You, had, you saw that have its impact on society, on culture, uh, on the intellectual development of of both worlds. Um, and uh, it, it, in terms in terms of a global impact, I, I think it's something that. Is really just not very fully appreciated. Is what the, just the 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 what the Crusades did for uh, sort of the the you know the world as a whole um, at their time you know during their time and beyond. Yeah, those are some good points there, Rand. Um, and I, I think too, you know, it's interesting. The Crusader states create a bit of a boom for. Palestine. Uh, I, th I think it's, you know, we can certainly say that the, Crus the Crusaders and the, you know, what they established there did improve the situation of things like uh, um, just economically and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I think there was kind of a, a concentration of, uh, of wealth and some imp improvements that went on there that, um, you know, just, just kind of hadn't been, that, that sort of attention hadn't been brought to that part of of the world for, for a little bit. Uh, like, you know, for example, uh, what, what Accra is going to become this kind of, uh, lavish trade hub, uh, over the course of, uh, it's, you know, history in the crusader States. And, uh, you know, Jer Jerusalem is kind of going to be built up in a way that it, it hadn't been in a while. So, um, so yes, some interesting stuff there. Um, well, so I think we've kind of come to, to the end of, talking about the battle of Ascalon and the establishment of the, of the kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, any further comments from anybody? Uh, Dr. Yeah. Hamlin, Rand, oh. Scott. Well, I just wanted to bring up, you know, the crusaders who returned to Europe. I mean, mm -hmm. just, just talk about them some, you know, what was their situation? You know, of course there's the stories of them, you know, most of them threw away their armor and returned with nothing but palm fronds. I mean, what type of exact is this an exaggeration? And you know, what how are they received at home? Uh, you know, just this type of thing. What do they do? What 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 did they pursue? Uh, just looking well, for comments it. there. I think again, one thing to you know, one thing to keep in mind again is you know the 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 medieval chroniclers' uh, attachment to hyperbole. Yeah, that, well, that's what I was thinking. It, 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 let, let you know, let's be realistic. You, you know that you know suits of armor were incredibly expensive investments. Yeah, who's so, going to throw away a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff? <laughs> yeah, the worst. nobody's going to do that. It, you know, let, you know, it, it was probably trying. You know, those those. Sorts of uh, sources were trying to evoke, uh, you know, biblical, scriptural yeah. imagery and things like that. But imagery um, but, of renunciation and piety and this type yeah, of but thing. At the same time, I think um, you know, crusaders went on uh, for as long as crusading was a thing uh, in in Western Europe. Um, crusaders went on to have a very special distinction um, in in European society. They they were kind of seen as um, they, they were seen as elites. They were seen as as people who had gone above and beyond, um, you know, what was expected of them uh, as Christians, um, and uh, and it was a uh, it was it was very much a mark of distinction um, to this day, uh, you know, in places like England and and France, in the few places in France where you can still find uh, medieval funeral funeral uh, or you know tomb effigies. 
Um, you know, Crusaders were even, uh, you know, they had they had distinct tombs. You know, the, the effigies always had the legs crossed. You know, it was um, they they were seen as sort of a um, kind of you know the few. Um, now, did this hold true for the the uh, you know infantrymen or man at arms as well as the knightly class? I, I mean, reason, were they? I, I don't. I would not see any reason to to think why not. Um, yeah. Granted, granted, it was always within their class. You know, uh, you know, class distinctions were. So that they were, yeah, yeah. they were received within their own social milieu. Yeah. yeah, I think you can uh, kind of see how crusaders were viewed uh, by the uh, poetry and uh, things like that. That that were uh became in vogue after the crusades which uh you know there's a wide range of of crusade related poetry some of it kind of about uh you know the lover missing her beloved uh, you know because he's off on crusades but a lot of it was was uh about the the glories and the spirituality of these crusaders so they were uh I would say it's like, you know, uh, World War II veterans, maybe, how they were viewed uh, coming back and, you know, after uh, World War II, probably more than that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to overstate the impacts that the First Crusade had in, uh, you know, on medieval Europe and sort of also in, sh in shaping the direction that medieval European Christian civilization was going to go in. I mean, for one thing, the crusade is going to become this integral institution, you know, whereas if, if this whole thing had failed, I mean, I don't think that would have happened. I mean, this is going to impact things in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, the, the struggle against the Muslims in Spain is going to take on a whole new flavor. It's going to be incorporated into this concept of, of the crusade. And in fact, it's really interesting. Um, Several of these guys who were involved in the First Crusade, like Gaston of Bern, who we've, we've talked about, who was um, one of uh, Raymond of Toulouse's followers who ended up switching his loyalty to Godfrey, he goes back after the First Crusade, and he becomes uh, the right-hand man of uh, Alfonso I of Aragon, who's uh, the king of Aragon, who um, really thought of himself as a crusading king. He was someone who... Was, you know, he ruled in the, in the uh, early part of the 12th century, uh, pretty much right in the aftermath of the, of the First Crusade. He comes to the throne in 1104 and really kind of took to heart these concepts of, uh, of holy war. And he really applied that to his expansion into uh, the Islamic-held Ebro Valley, uh, south of uh, what was, um, you know, at the time this was the southern uh, frontier of the Kingdom of Aragon. And, uh, Gaston of Bern and then a couple of other uh, veterans of the First Crusade are going to become uh, kind of his close, uh, his close associates, and these are going to be guys who he's going to grant a lot of extensive territory to, and they're going to kind of be high-ranking men in his uh, in his court. So you know that happens. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, it's just, it's just pr pretty interesting how what a wide impact this, this has on uh, European civilization. There's a there's a really um, there's a really interesting um, story in terms of you know how how first crusaders were viewed you know especially like the you know those who returned to Europe um, and how they were regarded uh, there's a there's a really one of the I think one of the most interesting certainly one of the more one, one of the most uh, colorful uh, characters who or the, his story was one of the most colorful after the crusade was. Um, Robert was Robert Curthouse of Normandy. Um, when he came back, he had he had all sorts of adventures on his way back. Um, he he went to Sicily. He ended up marrying a. Um, he ended up uh, winning the hand of a of a Sicilian uh, Norman um, princess there, and uh, he ended up going back to Normandy, and got embroiled in all in in conflicts with his uh, his younger brother uh, Henry. Um, who who had taken the throne of England uh, at the time, and uh, led a couple of revolts against him. Well, at the Battle of Tinkbury, he was he was finally defeated, uh, and he was imprisoned um, 
uh, he was imprisoned in a castle in the Welsh marches uh, there in England, and there he spent the he spent the the rest of his life uh, in captivity, writing, uh, composing Welsh poetry. Um, and uh, but um, he would even in his imprisonment, he would still uh, people would uh, allegedly would flock to the castle where he was held to see him um, and and to just to to listen to the stories of of uh, you know one of the great first crusaders uh, and whatnot. So you know even all the way into, uh, up until he died. Um, so oh, that's interesting, Rad. I've always wondered if he was you know, just thrown into a dungeon or <laughs> I didn't think so. No, I think that, he had I'm kind of like a, elaborated on that. He had kind yeah. of like a house. In prison, house arrest. Kind of thing. Yeah, like a house arrest kind yeah. of situation. Henry the First of England was a real uh, kind of. I'm not a fan of of, of Henry the First of England, but um, he, he kind of he was kind of. Spent a lot, <laughs> I can't remember what his. Ex, he made an excuse to the Pope. He said, "Like, well, I've I've provided a comfortable retirement for my my crusading hero brother. You know, uh, who, <laughs> who, who's too tired too tired to deal with uh, life. But um, yeah. anyway." Uh, yeah. so, so yeah, that's, yeah. And Kurt Host, you know, he's, he's, he was a long remembered hero, despite the fact that he was kind of a disgraced, uh, you know, would be King. Um, he still, you know, he, he had, uh, there were stained glass windows, uh, made of him. I believe there's one at St. Denis with, with like a sort of a sure. equestrian image yeah. of him. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, and then of course, uh, Robert the second of Flanders kind of became famous. He kind of became known as Robert the crusader. He died in 1111, kind of involved in some of the, um, you know, some of the uh, local political uh, struggles that were going on. But he kind of got this reputation. And of course, Bohemund becomes one of the most famous men in uh, in Europe. Uh, the the name Bohemund becomes popular for people to name their kids and that sort of thing. But yeah. things didn't turn out too well for Bohemund in the end. He, he sure. did. Yeah. He did have a little bit of a depressing after story. Um, yeah, <laughs> to he, say the least. He tried to conquer the Byzantine Empire. I mean, he. Yeah, it, he was the, it, the chronicler who said that Bowman was a man always striving for the impossible. <laughs> That's a good way to describe him. Now, one story that I've read is about Rainbow Creton, who was the first knight to reach the top of the wall and the first assault on Jerusalem by ladder and he got his hand chopped off and but survived and when he returned to Europe he well at one point he supposedly had a a monk who was allowing who was uh, allowing his uh yeah who was usurping his lands to uh, had him castrated have any of you heard that story? It's not very nice. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's <laughs> I just. Not, no. you know, I mean, I think, I'm, you know, I, I don't think that's that surprising. You know, if if something like that happened, I mean, um, yeah, the, the 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 medieval world was still kind of a rough place and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, I don't. You know, I wouldn't say that that's typical of of uh, returning. But it just kind of was, you know, a little a little counterpoint to the idea of the reformed and saintly and revered man you know that's the way it strikes me at least yeah i mean i i i think that's that that's makes sense um in this book i read not too long ago by katherine lack or katherine lack actually about robert kurt host she did there was a point in her book where she pointed out all these returning crusaders though who ended up like going into monasteries and stuff yeah and that's another thing so that did happen too I like became priests yeah like there there or or who gave up titles to their land or something or gave, gave all their land to the church or um yeah or went back you know there was a a, a certain number of guys who, who who gave up uh everything and and went back to fight in the holy land so the, I think there was kind of like a, a certain group of guys who kind of were transformed by this, like became more, more spiritual. Very, very much so. And, and in fact, it, uh, you know, it kind of makes you, um, you know, a lot of those characters would, would become 
the the very beginning foundations of of what would later become the military orders uh you know the knights hospital or the knights templar um you know they were just these common knights who uh felt that they had to stay um and and really didn't feel like there was any uh, that there was any point ever going back. Um, it's kind of the kind of the phenomenon of you know somebody who uh, you know experiences something that's so intense and so and so uh, deeply uh, moving on a personal level that that um, there kind of is no there is no coming back from that. You know there there is no there is no uh, there is no coming home. You know, uh, from something like that, it's they're 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 sort of permanently changed uh, forever after, and um, you see that in characters like uh, like Hugh de Payen. Uh, and, you know, and who, then who we see also. And, oh, sorry, Rand, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh -huh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say Stephen of Stephen of Blois was chased back by his wife. <laughs> And ended up getting killed. So, what do you think, Dr. Hamlin? Do you have any comments on any of this? Or, well, I think uh, you know there were thousands of people who went on crusade, and everybody experienced it differently. And most of them never wrote about it. And so, unfortunately, we don't know. I think some of them probably thought this is the craziest damn thing I've ever done. I want to get back to France as soon as possible. Others thought this is the most spiritual moment of my life, you know, and and a whole range of uh, things in between. And um, so there is no one crusader experience. There were hundreds and even thousands. Uh, but overall, I would think that um, for, for most of the crusaders, it was a spiritual thing. And, you know, it seems like a complete paradox to us that you could go fight and kill people as a spiritual experience, but that's how they understood what they were doing. And um, whether they stayed or went home, uh, they had, uh, you know, they had gone on pilgrimage, and that's why some of them come home with nothing because one of the things the pilgrims do, you know, they had to have armor going there, but sometimes you just give all, all that you have to the poor as alms uh, as a pilgrim. And, and, you know, they had some, some of them probably did that. They gave away whatever they had because they didn't need their swords anymore. Uh, whereas others would have kept their armor and swords and gone home and be, you know, continued on at night, the life of a, a military aristocrat or a, you know, an ordinary soldier in some castle somewhere, you know, uh, being a part of the feudal system. But the, the image of these men returning in mass with just palm fronds is well, that was an exaggeration. That, that's, that's actually a part of a pilgrim ritual that you do on Palm Sunday, where when you march from Bethany to, um, the, uh, well, you, you march into Jerusalem back, you know, the, 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 the Via Dolorosa today is different than the Crusader uh, period. But you go into the city carrying palm fronds, uh, celebrating the triumphal entry of Christ. And so what they were doing is uh, enacting that ritual as kind of a homecoming thing. So, so I, I think they actually would have done something like that. Uh, it's, it's certainly possible. Well, it's just... You know, I guess the idea of just giving away the means of one's livelihood, which was very expensive. Yeah. And then well, returning home. And I mean, uh, yes, I can see a, some men certainly did that, but it was maybe not on the scale that, you know, is suggested. I guess it's my point. Yeah, there's always hyperbole, but you know, Saint Francis was a, a aristocratic um, man of the military caste, and he ends up doing exactly that. And yeah, so so some of them did it. It was probably unusual enough to to uh, you know give notice. Some of them may have had to sell their armor in order to buy passage back to to Europe. You know, they 
lost everything and and uh, somehow had to get home. And they couldn't really walk home because mm -hmm. uh, there was no uh, secure uh, land route. And so they had to go by sea, and that's expensive. And if you don't have any money, you sell what you've got to buy passage back to Italy or France or wherever. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, some really good comments. Um, this has been a really good series of podcasts that we've done. I've really enjoyed uh, getting to have all of you on. And um, um, I, I guess we've, we've really kind of covered everything. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to add, or are we, are we good here? Good here. I'm good. Great. Yep. Well, um, you know, Dr. Hamblin, on behalf of all three of us, I want to say uh, thanks so much for going on this uh, crusade with us, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> much less uh, froth with difficulty than the original. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit more, more comfortable uh, traveling. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks for having me. And your, your series of, of videos are great. Dr. Hamblin. Oh, thanks. I've watched every one and I intend to watch them maybe two or two or three more times. Three. I haven't even watched every one. They're <laughs> great. I mean, well, they go, you know, they just go into, they make the detail that sometimes gets away from me and, you know, in reading so clear. Well, thank you. They're really yeah, well done. Um, and on that note, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, plug Dr. Hamblin's uh, web presence. He is at crusadingwarfare.net, and he also has a YouTube channel called Crusading Warfare. Uh, both of those are going to be linked in the description information for this podcast. So we hope you will check out what Dr. Hamblin is doing. And um, yeah, and uh, Dr. Hamblin, where where are you in your series right now? Like, what's the next video coming out? Um, I just posted one on the uh, strategic situation in Anatolia on the eve of the Crusader march towards Antioch, and okay. then I've got another one just about done on the the march to Doralaim, which is a little bit complicated because the route is disputed. And then I'll do a couple on Dora Lamb. So that'll be in the next week or 10 days. Oh, that's where I am. And that's one cool thing about Dr. Hamblin's uh, videos is that you do a lot of background information, kind of context. Um, you know, you, you don't just talk about the battle or the siege. You kind of lay the groundwork for what was going on in that part of the world. And you have quite a bit of knowledge of sort of the Eastern uh, um, these Eastern cultures and some of the, in, for example, the Fatimids and the Seljuks. And I think that makes it very interesting because sometimes that can be overlooked. You know, we sort of focus on what was going on with the Crusaders and maybe overlook what was going on with the Seljuk Turks or the Fatimids and some of that sort of thing. So that's, that's a good thing about Dr. Hamlin's uh, videos. Thanks. So, yeah. All right. So yeah, d definitely check out Dr. Hamlin at crusadingwarfare.net. And, um, yeah, and so this has been a really great series about uh, the First Crusade. Um, I love the First Crusade. It's it's, uh, ex it's exciting. It was kind of uh, the first thing that drew me into the um, Crusade's history. I mean, you know, I think probably the same for a lot of people. Um, just really one of the most unique events in history. Um, just a fascinating, kind of hard to, to replicate um, thing. Definitely very unique among uh, in military history. I mean, it's a very unique kind of war. But um, and yeah, be sure and check out. Uh, Scott has a really good novel out that is uh, deals with the First Crusade called "To Shine with Honor." So if you want to check out some good historical fiction that um, you know is set in this period, the period of the First Crusade, then uh, you know Scott's uh, novel "To Shine with Honor" is good for that. And that will thank also you, Stephen. Absolutely, and that'll also be linked in our uh, description here. So, I want to say volume two is in progress, and I'm hoping to finish up the final draft by the end of the summer and maybe, you know, hopefully get it out this year. I think I will be able to. Great. All right, good deal. So, yeah, this is Real Crusades History. You can find us at realcrusadeshistory.com. Um, we do regular videos and podcasts on the history of the Crusades. So thanks very much to everybody who listened with us through this whole series. 
It's been great to have you all along for the ride, and we will uh, let you know what's going to be coming up next time we do one of these. So over and out for now.